It is impossible. It is not possible to please God without faith. For they that come to the Father. I'm one of those they. Are you with me this morning? We are coming to the Father. They that come to the Father. To the Father's house. Where the children of the Lord gather together and praise His name and seek His presence. They that come to the Father must, must, not may, not might, must believe that He is. Say, He is. Heavenly Father, You are. He is. And, and, you got to believe this too. That he is a rewarder. He is a reward. There's a reward, a payment, a reward for those, that's us, who diligently seek him. Let that be your prayer, the meditation of your heart. Like Pastor Carol was saying. For God so loved the world, everybody, all of us, the simplicity of the gospel. We, are the, we as humans are the ones who make it complicated. With God, it was never complicated. It was always simple. For God so loved the world. Even the people that in the natural we don't like, God loved them. He loved us while we were yet sinners. He loved us when we make mistakes. He loved us when we are disobedient. He loved and so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. What a gift. That whosoever, whosoever goes to college and gets a four-year degree, doesn't say that. Whosoever memorizes the New Testament, the whosoever believeth, it is so simple, in him shall be saved. Turn in your Bibles this morning. We're going to start in the Old Testament, the book of Exodus, chapter 4. When you find it in your Bible, say amen. Stand to your feet for the reading of God's Word. We're going to diligently, with our whole heart, with everything that is within us, we're going to seek the Lord, His presence, His wisdom for this hour, for our congregation, for our lives, for our families. We're going to seek God in this very moment. We'll start reading with verse 1 of chapter 4 of the book of Exodus. And Moses answered, now he's speaking to God. And he said, but behold, as we would say in our vernacular today, hold on, look. They will not believe me, nor hearken unto my voice. For they will say, The Lord hath not appeared unto thee. And the Lord said unto him, said unto Moses, What's in your hand? And he said, A rod. And he said, Cast it. God said, Cast it on the ground. And Moses cast it on the ground, and it became a serpent. And Moses fled from before it. And the Lord said unto Moses, put forth your hand, take it by the tail. And he put forth his hand and he caught it, and it became as a rod in his hand. Every head bowed, every eye closed, let's go before the Lord. Heavenly Father, creator of heaven, even the heavens, every star, every planet, the sun, the moon, this earth. All things were created by you, and we worship you. 
we, we bow our hearts, our, our, our minds. Father, we come before you. I ask in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, that you would fill this auditorium and this service with your presence, with your Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, I ask that you would open up the hearts, our heart, the heart of our understanding. That our hearts would be fertile soil to your word, to your message. That you would speak to us through your still, small voice, through your Holy Spirit, through your word. That your word would be a lamp unto our feet. That you would direct and guide us as a congregation, as a people, as families. Heavenly Father, that you would lift us up in this moment. That we would be as one one congregation ready to hear your word and ready to just let it produce fruit in our life. So right now we ask that your word would be fresh in our hearts, that it would produce good fruit in our lives. And we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. It's with great passion that I look at this one of the greatest callings, one of the greatest offices, one of the most significant tasks in all the Bible, in fact, in all history. It was the call that God placed on Moses. This call was a call that he was calling this man to go to, to, go to Egypt where the Israelites were held captive. They were enslaved and enslaved by the Egyptian people. And if you read chapter 3 of Exodus, you'll read where that God was having this conversation with Moses. He said, I have heard their cries. I feel their pain. And now I, the Lord God, the creator of the universe, and he said these words, he said, if they ask you who sent you, tell them, I am sent you. The great I am, I am that I am. You'll take these people and you'll bring them with my power and my authority out of captivity, out of bondage, into the land, and he says in chapter 3, where milk and honey flows. And then at the end of chapter 3, he says, and they're going to not go empty-handed. They're going to go with treasures, vast treasures. They're going to go with health, with protection. And this, this task that I'm putting, that I'm bringing you, Moses, into is a task where that you, as their leader, you will be their pastor. You'll oversee them. Millions of people, most estimates, three, more, than, more than three million Israelites. He would be handling a treasury that would, in our, in our uh, monetary system today, would be in the trillions of dollars. You would be managing an entire nation in the wilderness. You would oversee the construction of the temple that was built in the wilderness. But who was this man? And I've, with great passion, have always looked at the great men in the Bible that God would raise up. Who is this man? Why did God choose Moses? Why did God choose this man, this man, who was now on the backside of the desert, tending the sheep of his father-in-law, Jethro, married to a Midianite woman, this man, was a fugitive on the run from the law. When he left Egypt, he killed someone on the way out of town. He was in hiding, incognito. I don't even think the Midianites knew who he was. 
There's no indication in the Scriptures that they knew anything about him until he came to Jethro and he asked Jethro for permission to go back to Egypt to check on his family. And here this man is, a man that is what I would consider to be the least. There's nothing that would indicate to me he would be the man that God would raise up to be able to lead the children of Israel out of Egypt. There's nothing in the book that says that this man would be the man that would deliver the children of Israel from the hand of the Pharaoh. And here in verse 1, chapter 4, We see how that God, when He chooses a person, when He chooses somebody for a specific job, a specific task, He'll always give you a specific test. And so we're going to go to the test. Chapter 4, verse 1. And Moses answered and said, hold on, God. Look. Look. These people are not going to listen to me. They won't believe me. It's all a matter of perspective. How did he know they wouldn't believe him? Why was he putting that thinking, that thought, into this conversation with God? Excuse number one. I can't do it. I'm not qualified. I don't have the education. This is above my pay grade. This job is, is it's just not my anointing. You know, I, I don't think that uh, the spirit that caused Moses to say those words back then is dead. I believe it's still very much alive. Say amen. It's the spirit of excuses. I can't do it. I don't have the time to do it. And besides that, if I went there, the people don't even like me. Reminded me of a, of a mother that went into the... Uh, room of her son, and she said, honey, it's time to go to church. And he said, I don't want to go to church. People don't like me, and they don't listen to anything I say. And she said, I'm going to give you two reasons. Number one, you're 50 years old, and number two, you're the pastor. <laughs> but behold, listen, God, they're not going to believe me. They won't believe a word I have to say. I don't think that it was so much that he was afraid that they wouldn't believe him as much as he was afraid that he wouldn't believe him. What Paul say? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. We're so excited about Paul who persecuted the Christians. Now he knows Christ. The many times we overlook the first part of that, I can do all things through Christ. Before you come to the Father and believe that He is, you also have to believe that He is a rewarder of you, that He believes in you. The same God that was in Christ and raised Him from the dead is within us. And here God is saying, or excuse me, Moses is saying to God, they're not going to believe me. He was projecting his own fear. He was projecting his own disbelief. I don't believe me. If I went there, I'm not even going to believe the words of my own voice. I'm not qualified. That's not my anointing. And besides that, the people there don't even like me. Don't you know, God, I killed someone there like 40 years ago? Now, Moses was 80 years old when God appeared to him in the burning bush. 80 years old. And the older I get, the more that I realize, as you get older, you realize how much we as God's children need the fathering that we get from the Father. As a young person, you might think, you don't need it. I got this. Cockiness and arrogance is not faith. So he's saying now, hold on. I've been out here tending the sheep. No one's going to believe me. I'm not qualified for this. 
I've not studied for this. I don't have the money for this. I don't have the time for this. I can't go. You know, the people over there, they don't like me. I can't go to that church. I can't do that for God because I don't have the time to do it. I don't have the resources to do it. It's interesting how that when God hears Moses say these words, he doesn't go into a dialogue about what Moses is saying. He just ignores it. That's exactly right. Verse 2. Now God's turn. He's going to speak. And the Lord said unto Moses, What is in your hand? You know, so many times when someone asks us to do something, well, why don't you call so-and-so over there? Didn't he go to Bible college? Why don't you call on so-and-so? Didn't he have money? But God is saying to Moses, what do you have? What's in your hand? God will never ask you for something that you don't have or have the ability to do. I need three more amens. <laughs> God will never ask you to do something that he hasn't given you the resources. Well, hold on, I don't have much. All David had was a sling. And he took the giant. All the warriors of Israel had armor, swords, training, education in military academies. David was a shepherd boy. God wasn't looking for someone with a sword and a spear or military training. He was looking for someone who would believe. Simple. To believe. That was the test. Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him as righteousness. You know, when we look at that and we see that with Abraham, that he believed God, he staggered not at the promises of God through unbelief, but the Bible says that he believed calling those things which be not as though they were. I like the way the prophet Joel said it, let the weak say I'm strong. You know, so many times something bad happens and we want to tell, oh, how bad it is. I just want to tell you how weak I am, how bad the day has been. You remember in um, 2 Kings chapter 4 when the widow came to Elisha the prophet and she had this great debt and she couldn't pay the debt. Now, it wasn't her debt. It was her husband's debt. He had passed away and left her with this great debt, and they were coming to take her two sons away to put them into slavery, which was the custom of that day. And you know, a lot of times, debt or things or obligations or responsibilities that we have in our life were left to us. Maybe from your parents or your children or a relative. And she comes to the prophet and she says, I have this debt. And the prophet Elisha says to her, what do you have? What do you have? She said, I have nothing but a jar with a little bit of oil. He said, good, that's enough. Go and borrow all the jars that you can from all your neighbors. Go into your house, close the door, and begin to pour. And she did. Not only was she able to get enough money to pay the debtors, but she was able to get enough money to live on. When Jesus was teaching on the hillside, and it got late, and the disciples came to him, and they said, Master, great sermon, by the way, but the people are hungry. And Jesus said, feed them. They said, we don't have any food. He said, what do you have? Well, we have the young boy here with five loaves and two fish. And he took it, and he blessed it. What we have, what you have is enough. So many times we complain about what we don't have. Or we're looking at everyone else and what they do have. 
Here he is saying to Moses, what do you have? And Moses says, I have a rod. It's a staff. That's all I've got. And the Lord says, throw it down. He throws it down, and it becomes a serpent, a snake. Now, the King James says that he fled, but every other translation says he ran. (laughs) He ran from Pharaoh, and I can tell you right now that if you're running from something, everything will make you run, because that's the way fear is. If you're afraid of the virus, if you're afraid to to answer the phone, if you're afraid to go to church, if you're afraid, you're going to run. And everything, every time that something happens, you're going to run. Because that's what fear does. Just remember this. That at the name of Jesus... Every knee shall bow, including the virus. I don't even call it by its name anymore. It's a virus, and it is under the feet of God's people. Say amen. Because every knee shall bow. Every tongue confess. And if we don't do it, the rocks will cry out. The very creation of God will cry out. And he throws the staff down. The staff becomes the serpent. And then God says, pick it up. I remember we were sitting on the porch a few seasons back and the dog started barking in the corner and there's a snake there and, you know, I don't like to kill snakes. Some, most snakes are good. They do good for you, but I don't like snakes. I know most people don't. I don't like snakes. So we're looking at this snake. We look it up. I look it up online. And sure enough, as sure as I'm standing here, is a rattlesnake. I can tell you right now, I would not pick that thing up. (laughs) And they're not easy to kill either. They're really not. I, I had a shovel, and they're not easy to kill. So if you can project in your mind the the picture of a serpent the size of a staff. Now, this is a staff that he was using to herd or to discipline the sheep, probably about this tall, maybe even this tall. In the movie, it's about this tall. And he throws it down, and I'm going to tell you, now it's a serpent. God says, pick it up. Moses picked it up by the tail, and it became a staff. Then God said, put your hand, this is later on in chapter 4, said, put your hand on your chest, and it became leprous. Now, they had no cure for leprosy. Leprosy was a terminal illness. It would kill you. He said, now put your hand on your chest again, and he was healed. What God was saying was, I am your, I am your daddy, your boss, your big and strong, and I had the power over life and death. Don't be afraid. And over 200 times, God said to, to Moses, do this, and Moses did it. The greatness of Moses wasn't because he went to seminary. The greatness of Moses wasn't because that he was smarter than anybody else or that he was a better speaker. In fact, he was probably the worst speaker that God could have chosen. But God chose the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. God chose the things that are weak to confound the mighty. God chose that no flesh would glory in his presence. In the natural, none of this made sense. 
in the natural, this did not make any sense at all. Here you're raising up this man, this, this, this Moses, this man, this man to do these things, and he's not qualified. But he believed God, and he did what God told him to do. When I look at that, I, I think, wow, that's simple. If you go to any company, they have a mission statement. I remember touring the bank. A lot of you are probably members of it, USAA in San Antonio, Texas. And they'll tell you if you go to that bank, the vision of the bank, the purpose of the bank, their goals, you can go throughout the entire complex. You can talk to anybody there and they know exactly what that bank stands for, what they believe in, and who they are. But they also know that as one, I mean, you can even talk to the janitor there and he'll stop and he'll tell you everything about the vision, the plan, the goals of the company, the mission of the company. We as believers have a plan. We have a mission, and God has given us an opportunity to fulfill these goals. Verse 3, chapter 4, verse 3. He said, cast on the ground, he cast on the ground, it became a serpent, and Moses fled from it before it. And then the Lord said unto Moses, put forth your hand and take the tail Put forth his hand, he took the tail, and he caught it. it. became a rod in his hand. And then verse 5, that they may believe that the Lord God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, has appeared unto thee. Much of what we do in the natural complicates things. We have our own plans, our own ways of getting things done. We've been talking about spiritual warfare because we're in a war, we're in a battle. And this war and this battle is very real, but it's in the spiritual realm and it's going to be one in the spirit. One of the things that I've noted during this season, and, and I, I want to tell you that the Lord has, has directed me even more so to uh, encourage as many people as possible to double down on prayer during this season because this is a season when that we need to get closer to God than we ever have. And during this season of prayer and seeking God and seeking God's wisdom, I'm going to tell you this, that had we been in that season of prayer, in that dedication to God before this all came, none of this would have been a surprise. Jesus said, I do nothing but what I see the Father do. I say nothing but what I hear the Father say. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. The, the, the trick of the devil is to get us out from behind the hedge of God's protection. To get us to fight in the flesh instead of in the spirit. To get you bent out of shape, angry, mad, helpless. Frustrated. Because it is his goal to steal, kill, and destroy. And if he can get you distracted, if he can get you out in the flesh, he gets you out from behind your protection. The spiritual battle that we're in is a spiritual battle for the very soul. I'm not talking about the soul of our nation or even the soul of the church. I'm talking about our soul, your soul. Your soul and that as we are in this battle, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They are mighty. But the only way that we're going to do this is to gird up our loins. To believe that God is in control. That He has the power over life and death. That, it, that we're not given to a spirit of, peer, of fear, but a power and of love and of a sound mind. That His Word is within us. 
And that as a community, as a Christian community, as a congregation, as one people, we come together. And we stand believing that. Around the auditorium, bow your heads. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the fertile soil that is sown in this morning. I thank you for the opportunity to be a part of what you you were telling to Moses and how that we're able to to relive those moments with Moses during that time and how that we're able to, to access the same presence that you gave to Moses when he stood on holy ground, that we're on holy ground and that the burning bush is still here within us and that your Holy Spirit is flowing through us. And we thank you for that, Heavenly Father. Lord, I pray that your words would, would fall on fertile soil and that it would produce good fruit and that we would, that we would gird up our loins, that we would that we would focus on you. Now, if you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, in just a minute, I'm going to give you an opportunity to do that. Because I believe that it is not by accident that you're here today or that you're watching us. It is a divine appointment, if you have never accepted Jesus Christ, this is a divine appointment that you have an opportunity to meet the Creator, the great I Am, and make Jesus the Lord of your life. In just a minute, we're going to pray a prayer, and I want you to pray this prayer with me all across the auditorium. Let's stand to our feet. In a a time of seeking God and time of reference, In just a minute, I'm going to ask if there's anybody here that wants me to pray with them as we pray this prayer. If you'd like me to pray with you this morning when we pray, raise your hand. Thank you. Anybody else? Thank you. I see your hands. Bible says, if any two shall agree as touching anything in my name, I'm going to come in agreement with those who raise their hands. I know there's a lot of times that you don't have people to agree with in your life. But this is that opportunity. If you want it, want me to agree with you in prayer. Anyone else before I pray? I see your hands. Anybody else? Thank you, Lord. Father, in Jesus' name, those that raise their hands, I ask that in through the power of the prayer of agreement in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior, I ask, Father, that you would meet their needs, whatever they are, that you would bring forth healing in the lives of those that need healing, that you would heal brokenhearted, that you would heal marriages and families, that you would heal sickness, that you would take away sickness and disease, that you would heal the bodies of any believer, that you would heal finances, that you would restore finances in the name of Jesus. I ask, Heavenly Father, that you would give sound mind, that you would take away depression, that you would break the bondage of, of addiction, that you would break bondages, that you would that you would restore souls, restore the years the locusts have eaten, that you would restore families, that you would bring back wayward children. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we come into to your throne with the, with, the, with the power of your Son's name. And we ask that you would break the bondages. In just a minute, I'm going to pray a prayer out loud, and I want everyone who's here to repeat this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, come into my heart. I make you the Lord of my life. Take away all sin and grant me your righteousness. I believe in you. If you believe that this morning, say amen.